<laughs> and welcome to Noose Little Podcast. I am your host, Matt Gore. We are doing something special for you for Halloween, and we are going to have three separate segments of horror that is copyright free, so we won't get sued. Sitting here with me is Mita Tool, and Mita, you're a lover of Halloween, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. That's both our favorite. I think I think it I think it's both our favorite holidays. Oh yeah. You go. You love it more than I do because you actually decorate your house and go all out with it. Yeah, I don't do Christmas. I don't do Thanksgiving. I don't do Easter, but I do I do do Halloween. So. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I saw the picture of like the the marching baby dolls. Are you actually going to do that for your house? This little mar- these baby dolls marching carrying this little coffin. <laughs> Uh, maybe next year. Maybe if I have time to sort of prepare. I just didn't have time to like scout out uh, baby dolls to do it. Because you need like a hundred or like hundred and fifty or something like I, that. I think I could do it with probably twenty or thirty. You but think? That's that's still an excessive amount of baby dolls, and they need to be creepy and weird and dirty, and I'd have to go searching. So. Where I live, trick or treating really isn't a thing. You know, um, uh, it's just next to a highway, so we don't get any kids. But how many trick or treaters do you at, on average get? Uh, we used to get a lot more, but we probably get almost 200 every year downtown. I used to count and I gave up that after a while, but we, we ship them in. We have people come in cars <laughs> and drop the kids off on one end of the block and drive to the other end of the block and the kids do the round and then they get picked up, go to the next block. And I know none of these kids live in our neighborhood. So, Do you make Steven put up like those Halloween decorations and stuff or is it mostly you? Uh, he does... It was just me for a long time, and then Stephen, I sort of got him to do the, the ladder climbing and things like that. And then the last couple of years, his nieces and nephews, the they've come and helped us out because they came with him one year, and they really enjoy doing it, and then I redo it after they leave. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's gotten to be quite the event. They, they like to pull everything out of the tubs and then go, where does this go? And I'm like, I, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. But... uh we have a good time doing it so and it got done the beginning of october this year i was very excited yeah um yeah so you could actually uh, enjoy the full month of spookiness exactly yeah and Um, i i I might you know i don't know how many trick-or-treaters we're gonna get this year but i know that uh every year people go i get so look forward to your halloween decorations so i felt even if we don't do trick if we don't do trick-or-treating this year i i had to put the the decorations out so yeah no, I, I look forward to seeing the pictures of your house every year because you all, you always go all out and it looks really good. Um, but also here at the hut, we also uh, we have the hut's an old building. It has a lot of history, as we've talked about, and if it can be a little spooky, especially like downstairs and stuff. When you don't you think? Uh, it has its moments, yeah. If, particularly if you're here by yourself, it can be a little. It has creaks and groans like any old building does, and, and it can get kind of spooky. But we usually, uh, I haven't I haven't seen her, but we usually talk about how there is a ghost named Mildred that kind of hangs out in the basement. She's a friendly ghost, though, kind of like Casper. She is very friendly. She, uh, The building was built in 1934, if I remember correctly, and it was the American Legion hut, and they used to have USO dances and things here so I've, I've just sort of made the decision that she was a USO girl and uh, she likes the theater she likes us being here she's friendly <clears throat> she does like to steal things sometimes yeah she'll misplace <laughs> props and stuff like that um, numerous occasions if somebody will be like I put my thing right here this is my you know my makeup brush or my 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 prop whatever You'll go, well, just ask Mildred for it. And you'll turn around and say, Mildred, I need that. And you'll leave the room and you come back and it's right where you thought it was supposed to be the whole mm-hmm. time. It's pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but let me tell you, since we were talking about Mildred, my, my two experiences with Mildred. Okay. Since I, I might be the only one who actually has really true stories other than her stealing their stuff. The first time I ever encountered Mildred and really put any stock into her actually being here, like any theater... Every good theater has a spirit, you know, at least one. Because, you know, why else would you do theater? And, um, but we were cleaning up after the children's show. We used to do four shows a year, and the December show used to be what we called the kids' show. And it was 
primarily children. I think early on it had adults in it, but then it sort of, when Vivian took it over, it was all, un, you know, teenage and younger, played all the parts, even if it wasn't a children's show, they, she cast it with all kids. And there was always a ton of costumes. So we were taking costumes from the back room downstairs to where the costumes were stored. And I took, you know, 10 or so and grabbed them up and took them off the, the rack in the back room. And I went down the stairs, down the steps, all the way to the back of the basement and hung them up where they were, they were stored at that time. And came up the steps and went back to the back room and grabbed another handful of 10 or so and headed back down the stairs. And I'm clipping along at a nice pace, you know, going thump, 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 up, up and down the stairs. And I come back after at least my second trip. It was at least my second trip up the stairs again. And I went thump, 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 thump up the stairs. And behind me, I distinctly heard footsteps. Thump, 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 thump. Mm. And I stopped <laughs> to assess and went, is that what I heard? And I got that feeling, if you've ever had your eyes closed, and if you've got brothers and sisters, it's happened to you, but you've ever had your eyes closed and somebody's really close to you, you can feel them. Not the breath or anything like that, but you just feel the closeness mm -hmm. of somebody. Their presence, yeah. Somebody was behind me mm. at the back of my head. And I went, and I spun around and looked, fully intending, expecting to be nose to nose with somebody on the stairs, and there was nothing there. And I came upstairs and went, I think I'm Mount Mildred. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then there was another show, and I was taking off the the masking curtains, the blacks from the back in the back. And I was sometimes we staple them to the door rays or whatever so they don't flap. And I was taking the staples out, and I was bent over, and just on the edge of my peripheral vision, there was somebody standing there. Mm -hmm. And I turned my head just enough to sort of get a good look and there's nothing there yeah so i have not only felt her and interacted with her i've also maybe seen her so well, i don't know if anybody else has ever had those experiences but th those were my experiences with mildred <laughs> and now you're creeped out <laughs> no i was saying i am yeah i because <laughs> the ghost thing gets me a little bit too the ghost thing gets me a little it just does but now i'm wondering i'm like okay listen Mildred, if you're here, you're among friends. <laughs> I know you don't venture up here very much, but if you can hear us now, give us some sort of sign. Come on, Mildred. <laughs> She's not a performing poodle. She's not going to do that. I know, but we just want to acknowledge your presence <laughs> and appreciate that you're here. And if you could maybe, you know, communicate with us. Anything? <laughs> All right, Mildred, last shot. Maybe next year. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I always thought it would be really cool to set up a camera when we're not here just Ooh, to see. That's, that freaks me out. <laughs> well, and like, I, I, like I was going to say, it's like Mildred's pretty much the only one here now that I know of, but we used to have a really scary guy. He used to creep me out, but he, he was, I used to call him a coward. Because if you were here with any, if you were here by yourself, he made his presence. He, what? He, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking <laughs> about right now. <laughs> Maybe it's just me that felt this way. But there have been times when I've been in the building and went, nope, got to go. Can't be in here by myself. No. I have to walk away. Yeah, yeah that's how I and feel. And I've always thought, I, I've always considered that him. Because Mildred's actually very friendly. She likes us being here. She enjoys the shows. He didn't want anybody here. So when you're here by yourself, he sort of, it always feels kind of oppressive and unnerving. Mm -hmm. sometimes and sometimes it doesn't so it's not the building itself it's just but I haven't felt that in a long time so I think he's moved on because we also do more shows so we're not as dark as you know he's not left by himself as, right. as long so I think he may have moved on to greener pastures but or somebody just burnt some sage or something maybe <laughs> <laughs> who knows what people do when I'm not here <laughs> <laughs> oh god I don't even want to think about it that might be more hor horrifying than the ghost <laughs> don't use a black light <laughs> no I don't even want to think about it yeah, I, 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 I seriously, I don't like going downstairs by myself. I don't. I usually like having an excuse to bring somebody with me or something. Also, because if you fall down those steps and break a leg, it's always good to have a buddy. <laughs> it's like, Jesus, I could be down here forever. You don't go into the woods by yourself. You don't go into the hut by yourself. No, yeah. I'd rather not. <laughs> Maybe upstairs is fine, but not downstairs. 
I'm, yeah, downstairs is a little creepy. It gets, it's, it's interesting. Cause... There's like that really back room after the props oh, and after the yeah, costume room yeah. where it's just like, oh man. It is... <laughs> well, there's the room, the farthest room back has a window. So at night it, it doesn't have a light. So it's just the window. So at night it's dark. And then the one before that does have a pool light, but it's, it's got no windows. So it's almost like a little dungeon area back there. Yeah, I've low key wanted to do a haunted house in here. Um, but Stephen would probably hate that idea. We did it one year. <laughs> we did a haunted house one year. Oh yeah. Tell, yeah. What happened there? Um, I couldn't tell you what year it was. It was pretty sure it was the year we did the haunting of Hill house. I believe that was the same year uh -huh. and we did it for a week maybe before Halloween. And, um, we did it. It was when the downtown did a thing called Harvest Festival, and they did it down on the town commons. Right. <clears throat> and that was our big weekend. We we made quite a bit of money, and um, they had they had taken a lot of the flats and made like a maze downstairs. Not really a maze, but you had to zigzag up one side, and then you turn and then zigzag down the other side, and you came in the basement door and you left the basement door. Right. That's how, it, that's how I envisioned it. Yeah, yeah. There'd be like a little setup downstairs. And, um, the best part of that whole thing, I, <laughs> I played, I wasn't the, the front man. Cause that was John Colcom. He worked the door and took the money, but I was, um, I was the, when you came in, we had a curtain so you could walk in and then there was a curtain behind me. And I told spooky stories while we waited for the group ahead of, you know, that had just entered to kind of get halfway through before we let another group in because it was tight, you know, a tight fit, maybe five people at a time. And so my job was to stay in this little room that we created out of black curtain and their eyes would acclimate because it was really bright outside. So I would tell spooky stories and stuff like that and answer questions and kind of freak the kids out. And when that day when we were doing it during the day, Mary George, <laughs> Mary George Naren was involved and she was super excited. And she was like, before she started, we were ready to go. She goes, she goes, don't you think this will be awesome? And she was holding this lipstick case. It was this gold lipstick case. It was long and thin. And I said, what are you talking about, Mary George? She goes, I'm going to say it's my finger. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. And so she sat in one of the corners of like one of the zigzags in like the tiny little corner. And she's a small woman, mm -hmm. you know. So she's hunkered down in the corner on a stool. And when anybody would come into that room, she'd go, touch my bony finger, touch my bony <laughs> finger. And <laughs> I want to recreate that. Uh, just, you know, have Steven do it. <laughs> It'd be so and, much more scary. <laughs> and I just remember Ricky Klein poking his head through the curtain as I had a group of people waiting to go in. He goes, we're on a pause for a minute. And I said, okay, what's the matter? He goes, Mary George has them cornered. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she had a group of teenagers and they were going, you can't touch me. You can't touch me. And she's just sitting there going, touch my bony finger. And they're like, they're backed up into the corner farthest away from her screaming at her, talking about how she can't, right. you, you can't do that. You can't do that. And it was very funny. We, <laughs> we had and to make Mary George calm down before we could get the rest of the group by. <laughs> Mary, ran it in, ran it in. We need to keep them moving. <laughs> keep them moving. You're causing a traffic jam, Mary yeah. George. And that group was, was never seen, seen again. again. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do the exact same thing. I want to do the exact same thing. And at the very, very, we could have, we have Steven dressed up as a scary hobo. We could have someone out front doing Dracula stuff. We could have the, we could have somebody doing Frankenstein. And then at the very end, the last spooktacular finale, we have Reggie just sitting in a chair going, behold, <laughs> the horrors of age and then that would be the final scare for all the children because that would really put the fear of god in them it would <laughs> right <yeah. laughs> no but it was it was a good time it was fun it that day that day we had the harvest festival was the big day and then it sort of petered out right before halloween but you know it, it got where fewer people showed up so fewer people wanted to work it so it kind of just kind of we should have done it just a couple of days and been done with it but it was it was a good time it was like three dollars to get in mm-hmm and it was um it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. Well, with we need it. to do it again and jack up that price. <laughs> no, but the, in all seriousness, the the hut has already the ambiance of a kind of a haunted house, and it wouldn't take much, you know, just to make uh, and just to kind of implement that. But again, people downstairs, you know, stuff like that, poking in where they're not supposed to go. 
Well, and, and it, it worked out because for some reason we had to clear out the basement for something, and I don't know why why we had it cleared out because otherwise you it, the way it is right now you can't do it it's just so full of stuff but somehow we were able to clear out everything downstairs or incorporate it into the haunted house so that mm-hmm. like it worked but i don't know if you could do it now we've just got too many many things downstairs. Yes, there's a lot of stuff downstairs for sure um well so we have uh three spooky stories for you don't worry we'll get back to the uh regular uh, new uh, little podcast that discusses the history of the theater. We'll get back to that one next week, and we'll have Gene Marlowe on uh, in two weeks after this episode premieres. Uh, but we want to do a little special Halloween podcast to kind of like change it up a little bit. So we have brought in two actors, and including myself, we are going to read three stories, and they are Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, and that is going to be read by Rick Hardnon. And then we have The Pale Man by Julius Long, read by Keith Parrish. And then finally we have The Raven, which most of you know, by Edgar Allan Poe. And that's going to be read by myself. So we're just going to introduce you to those stories. Um, it's kind of fun. It's kind of like a little audio, radio play type of thing. And uh, something a little sp- spooky. Everybody's going to be all, you know, maybe not so much this year. But st- people still will get together during the holidays. So scheduling podcasts will be a little bit harder. So we wanted to give you something for Halloween and give you the rest of those pods, uh, push those pods to later because we both just, you know, dig Halloween so much. Right, Mita? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So the first one coming up here is going to be the classic poem, Annabelle Lee, read by fellow NLT actor Rick Herdnot. It was many and many years ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee, with the love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that her highborn kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason all men know in this kingdom by the sea that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. All right, not bad at all. Okay, now this next story, The Pale Man by Julius Long, is a little bit longer. It's a little bit more mysterious. There's a little bit more of a narrative structure there. And this is going to be read by fellow NLT actor Keith Parrish. I have not yet met the man in number 212. I do not even know his name. He never patronizes the hotel restaurant, and he does not use the lobby. On the three occasions when we passed each other by, we did not speak, although he nodded in a semi-cordial, non-committed way. I should very much like to make his acquaintance. It is lonesome in this dreary place. With the exception of the aged lady down the corridor, the only permanent guests are the man in number 212 and myself. However, I should not complain, for this is utter quiet is precisely what the doctor prescribed. 
I wonder if the man in number 212 too has come here for a rest. He is so very pale, yet I cannot believe that he is ill, for his paleness is not of a sickly cast, but rather wholesomeness in its ivory clarity. His carriage is that of a man enjoying the best of health. He is tall and straight, and he walks erectly and with a brisk athletic stride. His pallor is no doubt congenital, else he would quickly tan under this burning summer sun. He must have traveled here by auto, for he certainly was not a passenger on the train that brought me, and he checked in only a short time after my arrival. I had briefly rested in my room and was walking down the stairs when I encountered him ascending with his bag. It is odd that our venerable bellboy did not show him to his room. It is odd, too, that with so many vacant rooms in the hotel, he should have chosen number 212 at the extreme rear. The building is a long, narrow affair, three stories high. The rooms are all on the east side, as the west wall is flush with a decrepit business building. The corridor is long and drab, and its stiff, bloated paper exudes a musty, unpleasant odor. The feeble electric bulbs that light it shine dimly as from a tomb. Revolted by this corridor, I insisted vigorously upon being given number 201, which is at the front and blessed with southern exposure. The room clerk, a disagreeable fellow with a Hitler mustache, was very reluctant to let me have it, as it is ordinarily reserved for his more profitable transient trade. I fear my stubborn insistence has made him an enemy. Oh well, the summer's rests will probably do me considerable good. It is pleasant to be away from the university. There is something positively gratifying about the absence of the graduate student face. If only it were not so lonely. I must devise a way of meeting the pale man in number 212. Perhaps the room clerk can arrange matters. I've been here exactly a week, and there is a friendly soul in this miserable little town. He has escaped my notice. Although the tradespeople accept my money with flattering eagerness, they studiously avoid even the most casual conversation. I am afraid I can never cultivate their society unless I can arrange to have my ancestors recognized as local residents for the last 150 years. Despite the coolness of the reception, I have been frequently venturing about. In the back of my mind, I have cherished hopes that I might encounter the pale man in number 211. Incidentally, I wonder why he has moved from number 212. There is certainly little advantage in coming only one room nearer to the front. I noticed the change yesterday when I saw him coming out of his new room. We nodded again, and this time I thought I detected a certain malign satisfaction in his somber black eyes. He must know that I am eager to make his acquaintance, yet his manner forbids overtures. He wants to make me go all the way if he can go to the devil. I am not the sort to run after anybody. Indeed, the surly diffidence of the room clerk has been enough to prevent me from questioning him about my, his mysterious guest. I wonder where the pale man takes his meals. I have been absenting myself from the hotel restaurant and patronizing the restaurants outside. At each, I have ventured inquiries about the man in number 210, and no one at any restaurant remembered his having been there. Perhaps he has entree into the Brahmin homes of this town, and again he may have found a boarding house. I shall have to learn if there be one. The pale man must be difficult to please, for he has again changed his room. I'm baffled by his conduct. If he is so desirous of locating himself more conveniently in the hotel, why does he not move to number 202, which is the nearest available room to the front? Perhaps I can make his inability to locate himself permanently an excuse for starting a conversation. I see we are closer neighbors now, I might casually say. But that is too banal. I must await a better opportunity. He has done it again. He is now occupying number 209. I am intrigued by his little game. I waste hours trying to fathom its point. What possible motive could he have? 
I should think he would get on the hotel people's nerves. I wonder what our combination bellhop chambermaid thinks of having to prepare four rooms for a single guest. If he were not stone deaf, I would ask him. At present, I feel too exhausted to attempt such an enervating conversation. I am tremendously interested in the pale man's next move. He must either skip a room or remain where he is for a permanent guest. A very old lady occupies number 208. She has not budged from her room since I have been here, and I imagine that she does not intend to. I wonder what the pale man will do. I await his decision with the nervous excitement of a devotee of the track on the eve of a big race. After all, I have so little diversion. Well, the mystery guest was not forced to remain where he was, nor did he have to skip a room. The lady in number 208 simplified matters by conveniently dying. No one knows the cause of her death, but it is generally attributed to old age. She was buried this morning, and I was among the curious few who attended her funeral. When I returned home from the mortuary, I was in time to see the pale man leaving her room. Already he has moved in. He favored me with a smile whose meaning I have tried in vain to decipher. I cannot but believe that he meant it to have some significance. He acted as if there were between us some secret that I failed to appreciate. But then, perhaps his smile was meaningless after all and only ambiguous by chance like that of the Mona Lisa. My man of mystery now resides in number 207 and I am not the least surprised. I would have been astonished if he had not made his scheduled move. I have almost given up trying to understand his eccentric conduct. I do not know a single thing more about him than I knew the day he arrived. I wonder whence he came. There is something indefinably foreign about his manner. I am curious to hear his voice. I like to imagine that he speaks the exotic tongue of some faraway country. If only I could somehow inveigle him into conversation, I wish that I were possessed of the glib assurance of a college boy who can address himself to the most distinguished celebrity without batting an eye. It is no wonder that I am only an assistant professor. I am worried. This morning I awoke to find myself lying prone upon the floor. I was fully clothed, and I, I must have fallen exhausted there after I returned to my room last night. I wonder if my condition is more serious than I had suspected. Until now I have been inclined to discount the fears of those who have pulled a long face about me. For the first time I recall the prolonged handclasp of the president when he bade me goodbye from the university. Obviously he never expected to see me alive again. Of course, I am not that unwell. Nevertheless, I must be more careful. Thank heaven I have no dependents to worry about. I have not even a wife, for I was never willing to exchange the loneliness of a bachelor for the loneliness of a husband. <laughs> I can say in all sincerity that the prospect of death does not frighten me. Speculation about life beyond the grave has always bored me. Whatever it is or is not, I'll try to get along. I have been so preoccupied by the sudden turn of my own affairs that I have neglected to make note of a most extraordinary incident. The pale man has done an astounding thing. He has skipped three rooms and moved all the way to number 203. We are now very close neighbors. We shall meet oftener, and my chances for making his acquaintance are now greater. I have confined myself to my bed during the last few days, and have had my food brought to me. I even called a local doctor whom I suspect to be a quack. He looked me over with professional indifference and told me not to leave my room. For some reason he does not want me to climb stairs. For this bit of information he received a ten dollar bill which, as I directed him, he fished out of my coat pocket. The pickpocket could not have done it better. 
he had not been gone long when I was visited by the room clerk. That worthy suggested with a great show of kindly concern that I use the facilities of the local hospital. It was so modern and all that. With more firmness than I have been able to muster in a long time, I gave him to understand that I intended to remain where I am. Frowning sullenly, he stiffly retired. The doctor must have paused long enough downstairs to tell him a pretty story. It is obvious that he is afraid I shall die in his best room. The pale man is up to his old tricks. Last night, when I tottered down the hall, the door of number 202 was ajar. Without thinking, I looked inside. The pale man sat in a rocking chair, idly smoking a cigarette. He looked up into my eyes and smiled that peculiar, ambiguous smile that has so deeply puzzled me. I moved on down the corridor, not so much mystified as annoyed, the whole mystery of the man's conduct is beginning to irk me. It is all so inane, so utterly lacking in motive. I feel that I shall never meet the pale man, but at least I am going to learn his identity. Tomorrow I shall ask for the room clerk and deliberately inter interrogate him. I know now. I know the identity of the pale man, and I know the meaning of his smile. Early this afternoon, I summoned the room clerk to my bedside. Please tell me, I asked abruptly, who is the man in number 202? The clerk stared weary, wearily and uncomprehendingly. You must be mistaken, that room is unoccupied. Oh, but it is, I snapped in irritation. I myself saw the man there only two nights ago. He is a tall, handsome fellow with dark eyes and hair. He is unusually pale. He checked in the day that I arrived. The hotel man regarded me dubiously as if I were trying to impose on him. But I assure you there is no such person in the house. As for checking in when you did, you were the only guest we registered that day. What? Why, I've seen him twenty times. First he had number 212 at the end of the corridor. Then he kept moving down toward the front. Now he's next door, number 202. The room clerk threw up his hands. You're crazy, he exclaimed. And I saw that he meant what he said. I shut up at once and dismissed him, and after he had gone, I heard him rattling the knob of the pale man's door. There is no doubt that he believes the room to be empty. Thus it is that I can now understand the events of the past few weeks. I now comprehend the significance of the death in number 207. I even feel partly responsible for the old lady's passing. After all, I brought the pale man with me. But it was not I who fixed his path. Why, he chose to approach me room after room through the length of this dreary hotel. Why his path crossed the threshold of the woman in number 207, those mysteries I cannot explain. I suppose I should have guessed his identity when he skipped the three rooms the night I fell unconscious upon the floor. In a single night of triumph, he advanced until he was almost to my door. He will be coming by and by to inhabit this room, his ultimate goal. And when he comes, I shall at least be able to return his smile of grim recognition. Meanwhile, I have only to wait beyond my bolted door. And the door swings slowly open. All right. Strange and unsettling. Unsettling indeed. What could all that mean? Actually, I think it's pretty obvious who the pale man was. Um, but still a pretty good story. And that was actually appeared in a volume. I found that online. And it appeared in a volume of uh, Weird Tales, the old creepy style uh, periodical that used to appear during like the 40s and the 50s 
All right, and for our final, for our final uh, presentation this evening, we have The Raven, and it's going to be read by myself. So that's going to be our final part of that, and it's going up now. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, a someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books or cease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this it is, and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here, I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, and there stepped a stately raven of the stately days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with me, no lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched above a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, Wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what the lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bus, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven, 
Still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking that this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to this fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining than the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet lining with the lamplight glowing over she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, Methought the air grew denser, perfume from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempest sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that our word or sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting, Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonium shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that light thy hast soul spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, Still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. My soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. <laughs> Nevermore indeed. So that was the final bit of our little uh, Halloween special here, three stories. I'd like to make it an annual thing. Maybe uh, next year we can do maybe some original stories, maybe written by our fellow uh, NLT alums, if anybody would be interested in that. And we'll have like, what were you talking about? I also like the idea of the, like the two word creepy stories. What was that creepy story on Reddit you were talking about? The, not the two word, I'm sorry, the two sentence creepy stories. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the. I think it's a Reddit thread, and it's it's the creepiest story you can make out of two sentences. What was the one about the boy you said? <clears throat> I wish I could remember it verbatim because it was much better than what I was trying to to you know uh, trying to remember. It's I walked into my son's room where he was. A, he informed me he was afraid of the creature under the bed, so I looked under the bed and I stared into my son's eyes, and he said, "Shh, there's something on top of the bed." <laughs> Cool. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, and uh, I wanted to do like more creepy pasta stuff, but some some of that stuff is is copyrighted, and I didn't want us to get into any trouble as far as copyright. So I chose stories that were uh, all public domain. Maybe next year when we do get a little bit more of a jump on things, uh, we can try to set up something that's a little bit more uh, like local like a North Carolina ghost and stuff like that. Cause oh, I did, yeah. I, I did I research somewhere. Yeah. I researched a couple, but there was a couple one uh, th there's like, there was like Theodosia Burr, the ghost of the, the, go the, the portrait of Theodosia Burr. And it's just like, they give you the biography of Theodosia Burr, Aaron Burr's mm. from Hamilton, Aaron Burr's daughter, uh, made popular by Hamilton. 
uh, but she, she was lost in a shipwreck. She might have uh, near North Carolina and probably got attacked by marauders or, or, or pirates or something like that. And they give you the whole biography, but at the end I was like, oh yeah, and, the, and her painting, it, sometimes it's kind of spooky. And it's just like, that's not a ghost story. That's a biography of somebody with something spooky attached to it at the end. Yeah, there's the story of, is it the gray man on the coast? Yeah. yeah the, right before the storms mm-hmm, hit or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I, I did read that one. Right before a hurricane hits, there's going to be this gray man walking the shores. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's something about, um, is it Hannah Swamp? I didn't, I didn't read that one. I think it's called Hannah Swamp. That's it's down where the cypress trees and stuff are in the swamp area. There's there's something about that. I like I said. I've Devil's Tramping Ground. Devil's Tramping Ground, which I think has a bigger reputation than it actually deserves. But I, yeah, yeah, I've heard I've heard that too. Um, and now but, it's just littered with beer cans. So. Yeah, I know. Let's go to Devil's Tramping Ground. You know. But yeah, so next year. This is just a jumping off point. Next year, we might have something a little bit different, but still something spooky and Halloween related. I just like the idea of having a Halloween special every year, but we'll see how it goes. Who, None of us can predict what's, what the world is going to be like next week, let alone next year. So we'll right. we'll, we'll, we'll try to... <laughs> we'll, we'll, like this year hasn't been scary enough. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, it has been frightening indeed. All right, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, Thank you for joining us on this special Halloween edition of Noose Little Podcast. Uh, I am your uh, creator and host, Matt Gore, and uh, Mita Tool is our producer and sound editor. I want to thank the uh, actors that came by and read for us this evening. They were very good, and we were we actually got through it much faster than I thought they were. So thanks to Rick Herdnon and Keith Parrish. And we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have uh, them on down the line on the podcast and do an interview format one day. We'll get there, but. Uh, we just want to thank them for coming on out and doing a great job. Also, uh, I want to thank you guys for liking and subscribing the podcast uh, to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I want you to continue to do that. If this is your first episode, please click that button on the Apple iPod uh, app on your phone, or excuse me, the Apple Podcast app on your phone, and the Spotify button and the Spotify app. And that's the it says that's the follow button in that particular app. So. Really appreciate you guys doing this. Like I said, we're going to have Gene Marlowe on in two weeks, and uh, and we're going to get back to the grounding, uh, the ground, uh, the the early days of news and uh, the establishment of the theater proper. So can't wait to talk about that. And for Loose Little Podcast, I am Matt Gore. We'll talk to you later.